Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2018 President's Town Meeting. It is now my pleasure to introduce the 18th President of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming. And let me offer my greetings to those who are watching us online in Troy and Hartford and around the globe. So let me begin by uh, introducing our leaders. Let me begin with the President's Cabinet, uh, the gentleman you just met, Dr. Prabhat Hajela, Professor of Aerospace Engineering and our Provost. <laughs> Dr. Jonathan Dordick, Vice President for Research and the Howard P. Iserman, mm. Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Vice President for Institute Advancement. And Richie Hunter, Vice President for Strategic Communications and External Relations. Mr. John Cole, Class of 79, Vice President for Information Services and Technology and Chief Information Officer. Dr. Lee McElroy, Associate Vice President and Director of Athletics. Curtis Powell, Vice President for Human Resources. Uh, Mr. Claude Rounds, Vice President for Administration. And I think uh, Ms. Gregg is not able to be with us. Jenny Gregg, our CFO. Uh, Mr. Lenormand Strong, our Interim Vice President for Student Life. And I believe Mr. Jonathan Wexler, uh, who's off uh, admitting students. So let me also introduce our academic leaders, Professor Thomas Begley, Dean of the Raleigh School of Management. <laughs> Professor Kurt Brenneman, Dean of the School of Science. <laughs> Professor Evan Douglas, Dean of the School of Architecture. <laughs> Professor Shaker Garde, Dean of the School of Engineering. Professor Mary Simone, Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Science. <laughs> Professor Stanley Dunn, a Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Education. <laughs> Professor Linda Shadler, Vice Provost and Dean of Undergrad. <laughs> you may be with us virtually, Dr. Eric Krauss, who's Dean for Academic and Administrative Affairs for Rensselaer at Hartford. And I don't know if I've seen him, but Professor Peter Fox, Director of Information Technology and Web Science. And I also would like to introduce uh, Mr. Travis Apgar, Assistant Vice President and Dean of Students. And Mr. Assistant Vice President for Student Success. And I'm going to get her name wrong. Uh, Assistant Vice President. Michelle Talinchi Michelle, who is our assistant vice president for and a host of others. How's that? And of course, the wind beneath my wings, Professor Morris Washington. Now, to together, these folks, uh, with all of you, uh, make Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute a transformative force in research and pedagogical innovation and of course in the lives of our wonderful students. So uh, would you join me in thanking all of them for what they do. In late January of this year, I had the great privilege once again of representing Rensselaer at the World Economic Forum <coughs> annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, I'm actually co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on International Security. And I was asked to lead a session titled, The Geopolitics of 2030. And with the session, I was given the fascinating challenge of considering the major factors likely to shape the global security landscape a dozen years from now. Now, since all of us here at Rensselaer are focused on changing the world, I would like to begin today in a different way by offering you an overview, of some key points from my presentation at Davos and of the risks, vulnerabilities, and opportunities that we discussed that in fact provide a context for all of our best efforts 
at Rensselaer over the next dozen years. Now first, in 2030, uh, we are likely to be living in a lower carbon world with a changing energy mix that will shift international alliances and alter the definition of strategic resources. As you know, countries rich in oil and natural gas have used their resources to great geopolitical advantage in the past. And fossil fuels will continue to be used. However, renewable energy does have the advantage of being able to produ be produced locally, potentially allowing the EU, for example, to become less dependent on Russia and bringing electricity to rural populations in the developing world that never before had access to it. Of course, there will still be critical strategic resources. They will just be different. For example, as the transportation sector electrifies, materials essential to lithium-ion batteries will be key. Now, the production and mining of some of these materials is currently limited to a few geographies. Uh, as much as 54% of the identified lithium resources globally are in what is called the lithium triangle of Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. 55% of cobalt is mined in the conflict-ridden Democratic Republic of the Congo. And 66% of the world's graphite is produced in China. Now, unless the world identifies new sources or substitutes for these resources, they represent a security risk, as well as bringing it home an extremely interesting challenge for our materials, devices, and integrated systems center here at Rensselaer and its associated students and faculty. The second factor shaping the geopolitics of 2030 is climate change which is likely to cause droughts already is in Africa and to threaten rain-fed agriculture there. At the same time as sea level rises and storm surges threaten low elevation coastal cities around the globe with South Asia being particularly vulnerable. Coastal regions of the US are not immune either. Now the world may see, and to some extent already does, large migrations of climate refugees and governments destabilized by natural disasters. Now there are nonetheless new geopolitical opportunities as well, opened up ironically by climate change. The shrinking ice co uh, cover in the Arctic Circle is allowing new resources and trade routes to be exploited, including ironically an estimated 30% of undiscovered conventional natural gas reserves and 13% of undiscovered conventional oil reserves. Now control of these resources and routes is likely to be a source of tensions among the US, Russia, and other nations. And what people don't realize is that if one looks there, the US has the <coughs> smallest border of the countries that uh, border that uh, region. Now the third factor shaping the geopolitical landscape is the diverging demographics between the aging developed world and the developing world, which is experiencing a youth boom. In 2030, the divides will already be extreme, with much of Africa having a median population age under 20, while countries in Europe, as well as China, Russia, and Japan, will have median ages more than twice that. Now, there are challenges on both sides, Aging developed economies may struggle to maintain GDP growth with a scarcity of people of working age. Advances in artificial intelligence and robotics, the things we work on here very strongly, may be crucial to increasing productivity and to keeping developed economies from stagnating. At the same time, artificial intelligence and machine learning may speed up the disappearance of middle skilled jobs and increase income inequality. <coughs> developing nations such as India, Pakistan, Egypt, Nigeria, and <coughs> Kenya, in contrast, all will have growing working age populations between the ages of 15 and 64. And this would be a great economic benefit to them. But a key question is, do they have, which they don't have today, but will they have the education, opportunities, and infrastructure to take advantage of it? And so a key challenge to rising uh, living standards is this. 
working age populations will grow the most in south asian and african countries where average education levels are among the lowest now recent history suggests that states with youthful populations and insufficient opportunities are the most prone to intrastate political violence now the migrations that have been provoked by such instability in combination with the sense that globalization has not benefited the middle classes in the developed world have helped to shape uh, recent politics in the United States and in the United Kingdom. Yet migration can offer a, a long-term benefit to nations with aging and shrinking populations. Because of immigration, in fact, the United States is not projected to grow as old by 2030 as nations such as Russia, Italy, Germany, Spain, and Japan. In fact, the United Nations predicts a median age of 40 in the United States in 2030, 45 or more in the other countries. But a question is, will current policy changes vis-a-vis -vis immigration alter that trajectory? Now, the fourth factor shaping the geopolitics of 2030 is in fact rooted in the technologies of what has been called the fourth industrial revolution. In other words, technologies that are merging the digital realm with the physical and biological worlds. The diffusion of such technologies and communications connectivity make it more difficult in certain cases for central states to govern. They allow for the growth, in fact, of transnational alliances, such as alliances of multinational corporations, non-governmental organizations, so-called NGOs, and other multilateral organizations at one end of the spectrum, or transnational terrorists or criminal groups at the other end. Now, new technologies allow, as well, internal groups, including cities and states, to challenge central governments and to create instability without having large militaries, economies, or populations. Now, of course, the shifts due to connectivity can be exacerbated by the fact that many technologies of the fourth industrial revolution can be easily weaponized by non-state actors, including commercial drones, which have delivered bombs in the Middle East, 3D printing, which has produced grenade launchers, CRISPR gene editing, which may facilitate the production of biological weapons, and cyber physical systems that may offer new angles of attack. Yet, as we all know here at Rensselaer, Advanced technologies can heal divides, as well as create them. A key question is, can technologies address the widening demographic gulf between developed and developing nations by enabling intergenerational linkages in ways that create greater productivity and innovation? If so, these technologies would confer economic strength by virtue of building economies that simultaneously take advantage of the forward-looking and risk-taking of the young and the wisdom and experience of older populations. In other words, could the world come to, in fact, resemble Rensselaer and other great universities more closely, where we work together across generations, where each year the most distinguished of our faculty members welcome incoming freshmen in anticipation of learning from them as well as teaching them. And this kind of linkage would require a new kind of intergenerational compact that has yet to evolve on national levels. Now most of the freshmen that we will welcome this fall will be 30 years old in 2030. In other words, beginning to fully grasp their own powers. And it will be long to our students to address the risks, vulnerabilities, and opportunities I've just described. Now here at Rensselaer, the new Polytechnic, we work to ready all of our students for these challenges by fostering three essential qualities, intellectual agility to see across disciplines and to create entirely new tools and technologies that will change the world. The multicultural sophistication that creates empathy and that allows them to reach across generations, geographies, sectors and disciplines to address great challenges. And a global view 
that recognizes the degree to which the most important risks, vulnerabilities, and opportunities are broadly shared by all of humanity. Now, our superb academic programs prepare Rensselaer students to lead, and I congratulate our faculty, students, and administrators and staff for the degree to which these programs are now being lauded by many different sources. For example, our information technology and web sciences program has been ranked first in the nation by college choice among undergraduate programs at national colleges and universities. College Choice also ranked Rensselaer eighth among the best colleges in New York State. Now, our Masters of Business Analytics has been ranked third by TFE Times. Our undergraduate physics program is ranked sixth by College Factual. Our School of Architecture is ranked 13th by Design Intelligence. Our Games and Simulation Arts and Sciences program is ranked sixth by thebestschools.org seventh by gamingdesign.org, and twelfth by the Art Career Project. In addition, the 2018 edition of the Princeton Review's annual guide, Colleges That Pay You Back, ranked Rensselaer 19th in the nation for best career placement. In other words, we offer our students a superb education and a superb entry to their careers, which is growing even more superb with the opportunities for experiential learning afforded by the away semester of the Arch. We also are adding to our academic offerings in emerging fields with a new Bachelor of Science degree program in music that will begin this fall, as well as a new focus on quantitative health economics in our economics department. We're developing a new Bachelor of Science program in the Lally School in quantitative finance and analytics and a new degree or minor in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now our ability to anticipate which emerging disciplines are likely to prove most important is one reason why demand for Rensselaer education has never been higher. Overall applications for undergraduate admission for the upcoming freshman class for the fall of 2018 now number 20,375. And that is a 5% increase from last year's record-breaking number. Now, even more telling is the fact that for an enormous number of students, Rensselaer is their very first choice. So they decide to apply for early decision, which is binding if we accept that. And we received the most early decision applications and confirmations in our history. And 30% of the incoming <coughs> class of freshmen will have been admitted through early decision. And this also will be the strongest academic incoming freshman class we have enrolled in terms of academics with the average SAT up another up nine points over last year. We expect to achieve a very diverse freshman class, a particularly strong group of young women and underrepresented minorities applied this year. And we admitted 14% more women than last year and 11% more underrepresented minorities. The geographic diversity of the class is sure to be strong as well, with 42% of the students offered admission stemming from outside the Northeast, and that's against an applicant pool where 51% were from outside the Northeast. Now, to allow us to achieve all of our missions in research and teaching and student life, on March the 3rd, the Rensselaer Board of Trustees approved an overall operational budget for fiscal year 2019 of $439.5 million. Tuition for full-time undergraduate and full-time graduate students will be $52,550, an increase of 3%, which is in line with other colleges and universities. On average, room and board rates will increase 2%. However, the financial aid budget, on the other hand, will increase 5.3% from the current level. Included in this figure are resources to assist students who encounter unexpected financial hardships during their time at Rensselaer. The minimum academic year stipend for graduate students will increase to $23,000 
so that we are competitive with peer institutions and we will continue renewing our world class faculty filling the remaining tenured and tenure track faculty positions planned in fiscal year 2018 budget but including four constellations in addition we will hire teaching fellows and lecturers to maintain instructional instructional quality and we will be adding new staff as we move towards the implementation of the arch in the summer of 2019 we also will continue to invest in our clustered learning advocacy and support for students or class designed to provide one of the best student experiences in the United States. Now our new off-campus commons on 15th Street, the physical instantiation of one of the pillars of class, is proving to be extremely popular, particularly as a location where students can gather to study. We recently launched a new safe ride program there, which arose out of conversations that I had with some of our female students who told me that after late nights of studying or socializing, they truly needed door-to-door -door transport to feel safe on the way home. So in addition to the expanded routes and hours of our shuttle bus service, we now have two electric vehicles donated by American Honda Motors to offer rides until three in the morning, seven days a week. And demand for this service already is quite intense, so we might be looking for a third vehicle. <laughs> now, of course, to achieve all that we would like to, the success of our billion dollar capital campaign is essential. Transformative cap campaign for global change was launched in October with 400 million already committed, thanks to the generosity of our alumni, alumni, parents, friends, and partners. And since the campaign launch, we've raised an additional 25 million, nearly that, towards the billion dollar mark, with the ultimate goals, importantly, of eliminating the gap between student financial need and the scholarships and fellowships we are able to provide to them endowing many more professorships to attract and importantly retain the best academic talent, and expanding our faculty to 500 in critical areas of research and teaching, and of course upgrading and expanding our campuses physically and technologically to accommodate our growth, including our intent to build a new Center for Science multidisciplinary and to expand the Johnson Engineering Center. And as we move towards the 200th anniversary of our founding in 1824, and towards the geopolitics of 2030, the future of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute is bright, bright indeed. Now in the more immediate future, of course, we will be uh, launching into the world our next class, as we welcome a group of extremely accomplished men and women here in May for our 212th commencement to award them honorary degrees and importantly to allow our students to have models of what their careers can become and to learn from them. And so I'm very pleased today to announce our honorands. First, we will welcome Mr. Herbie Hancock. legendary jazz pianist and composer who over a nearly 60 year career has achieved, received an Academy Award for his round midnight film score and 14 Grammy Awards including Album of the Year for The River, The Joni Letters and a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. We also will welcome Ms. Mary Jo White who is a litigation partner and senior chair at the law firm of Devil Boys and Plimpton. Chair of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, from 2013 to 2017, strengthening enforcement and protections for investors in the wake of the financial crisis. Now, as U.S. Attorney, and this is very important, for the Southern District of New York for nine years, 
Ms. White oversaw major prosecutions for terrorism and white collar and organized crime, including a successful prosecution of the people responsible for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. We also will welcome Dr. Eric Lander, president of the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, professor of biology at MIT and professor of systems biology at the Harvard Medical School, a mathematician, molecular biologist, and geneticist. He was the principal leader of the Human Genome Project. He has done pioneering work in the molecular basis of diseases, human genetic variation, human population history, genome evolution, and many other fields. And we will welcome Ms. Alicia of the Rensselaer class of 1998. In June of 2016, she was named Executive Vice President and Manager of General Motors Global Manufacturing, which makes her not only one of the most powerful women in the automotive industry, but also one of the most powerful people in American manufacturing. She was named Black Engineer of the Year in December. So we have quite a group. And we expect a lively and thought-provoking conversation with these four guests at the President's Commencement Colloquy, which will be held on Friday, May 18th at 3.30 p.m. in the Impact Concert Hall. And our theme will be Breaking Paradigms and Transcending Borders transformative leadership in the 21st century. And I hope that all of you who are able to will join us, and your parents for those who are graduating. And now, I'll be happy to answer questions, but what I thought we would do is, since I know that a number of you received this flyer, we thought we would just walk through these questions and uh, give you uh, answers to them. And so, the first uh, says that the director of the union search has stalled and that the administration gave a candidate the interview question, then denied doing so. So I'm going to ask uh, our vice president for human resources, Curtis Powell, followed by our dean of students to address this. Is it on? Yeah, great. Listen, uh, first of all, we have reconstituted the search uh, for the director of the union. We had one candidate remaining, and uh, we had two candidates to go through the entire process with constituencies. I was asked to have the candidates to come back to meet with the executive committee of the students, uh, student board. Yeah. And when that candidate, one candidate withdrew, withdrew from the uh, approach, and he did not want to go through the process. So the remaining candidate came back, and I was informed by Matt that the candidate had the question. I don't know where the candidate received the questions from, whether he wrote them down or whatever. So I decided that we would reconstitute the search, and that's what we're doing. And we're going to be kicking that search off uh, within the next two weeks or so. Travis. Okay, Travis, to make any comments? Yeah, I think that uh, you know I would echo too much of what Vice President Powell said. You know, we're looking forward to meeting on Monday with members of the Senate and the Executive Board. Uh, we'll meet with the PU and the GM prior to that meeting and uh, talk through you know how the uh, search will. will um, go forward. Uh, students will be intimately involved in, in the process and, um, and you know, their, their input will be weighed heavily on, on our ultimate decision and uh, looking forward to you know, filling that position, bringing somebody to campus that has you know, all the talents and experience to really help the union continue to be successful. You know, let me just reiterate about uh, searches, all of our searches here. We've been very successful 
And to participate in, this, in these searches, it's not a right, it's a privilege. And given that privilege, we do expect individuals to act accordingly in representing this institution. And we went through a process of working with the student leadership. And I'm gonna change that process of how we do business. That's why I'm meeting with the students on Monday. So if you wanna know how we're gonna change it, be at the meeting at 12 noon on Monday. Because we're not gonna tolerate what we went through the last time. But I will say to you that uh, one reason that Mr. Lenormand Strong is not here is that he and, and Matt Rand and Cameron uh, are all out at a national meeting uh, where a lot of the recruiting of student uh, affairs professionals occurs to talk about the union position as well as uh, other open positions in the student life arena. So in point of fact, uh, you know, Matt is engaged and, and we're moving ahead. A second uh, comment said that RPI claims eminent domain on a public sidewalk. And so I thought I would ask uh, uh, Richie and uh, Hunter and Craig Cook in whichever order they'd like to address uh, that issue. Thanks, President Jackson. So hopefully everyone got a chance to take a look at what was written about the situation. It happened during um, Big Red Freakout and there were students that were handing out some materials in the front of the entryway into the, um, the field house. And public safety came to them and asked them to move, and they did. And there was no issue with that. We absolutely believe in freedom of expression, and we support it. The students carried on and with their activities in another location. In the course of that, the public safety officer used the term eminent domain. It was not an appropriate term. It was not applicable in the situation. For the multiple media outlets that asked me that question, I told them time and time again, as well as students, that eminent domain wasn't relevant. He made a mistake. So to make that national news is just, it's, it's a sad reflection on our community. He made a mistake. So eminent domain was not the correct term. There's, you know, writing columns about it is not necessary. And we do have our general counsel here. If he wants, to, if you want him to explain more about what eminent domain actually means, we can go into that conversation, but I don't think that that was the point. But we do have a few other details about this situation related to the actual property and why we have these policies. Thank you, Richie. I'm not going to explain eminent domain. You guys can figure that out yourself. <laughs> um, but Richie's right. It's, it's not applicable. Look, the, the bottom line is, and the, the officer may have made a mistake in his phraseology, but the property on which the students were on and handing out uh, materials was Rensselaer-owned campus property. And if anybody wants to verify that, go down to the county recorder's office and look up the deeds and you'll or a little bit of looking, because you gotta go back to 1942, you'll figure that out. But, um, but look, let me just step back a second and say, why do, we have, why do we have rules about people setting up booths or handing out materials? Look, there's lots of organizations around that would love to come onto our campus. It's a great captive audience. They'd like to come in, they'd like to, credit card companies would like to come in and maybe sell credit cards. We might have politicians who would like to come in and, and, and hand out, and hand out, you know, flyers, or maybe they have students that they're affiliated with who are RPI students, who they'd like to have them do that for them. Or the NRA might want to have some students that they're affiliated with come in and, and hand out stuff. So we try to have a policy that says, look, we want to not have that for our campus. We want to have a controlled environment. So we say, look, you, if you want to do solicitation on campus, you need to be a student recognized, organ you need to be a recognized organization, and you need to coordinate that with the facility coordinator for the property, whether it's the athletics department or the MPAC or whatever. And so that's the, we, the, the, the policy we try to follow. We're not perfect at it. We don't catch every one of them. But we try to do that, and you try to do it consistently. Because if you don't do it consistently, then the next 
group, whether it's the NRA or whoever wants to come on campus and says, well, you didn't enforce it against them, why are you enforcing it against us? So, so yeah, it's not, it's not always easy. You know, we prefer not to have all this controversy. But you have to make hard decisions, and sometimes you have to just do it to be consistent. And again, we try to be consistent. I'm sure you can cite 10 times when we're not. Now, if the rules aren't clear, and, and I understand there's been some dispute about what the handbook says, I'm happy to sit down. Dean Apgar and I are happy to sit down. We'll sit down and we'll clarify the rules. But that's basically um, the point on that. So. Okay. Thank you. The Jackson administration forwards an insulting email to all alumni. Again, I think Richie and Greg uh, want to address that. So who all is aware of um, Professor Bystrup's email? Is Professor Bystrup here? No? Okay, well, um, I won't go into the details of how the email came about, but I, what I will say is this, just as I mentioned before, we are completely supportive of freedom of expression and freedom of speech. And Professor Bystrop, just like each of us, is entitled to his opinion. He shared his opinion, he shared it very widely, he shared it in a very public way. And we support that. However, his opinion is not the official position of the Institute. It doesn't mean that we, we, don't, we don't even make a judgment on his opinion, just like of the opinion of anyone else. So that's what I have to say about the Bystrop email, of which much has been written about as well. Some true, some not true. Um, but hopefully that clarifies it. And I think that in speaking with Apolly, actually, with you um, and responding to you, we've been very clear about where we stand. And we have a very inclusive environment. And we know that we have a diversity of opinions, not only within our campus community immediately, but also within with our alumni. We educate people to question, to have positions, to have perspectives. And they're not all going to be the same. So with that, we support everyone to have their own opinion. Thank you, Richie. And there is a question, you know, what I actually made the decision to send the email out. Uh, the email was always go already going out in a very public, broad domain area. And it was to inform and to educate, and it was not to make an opinion. And so I do want to clarify that. I've talked with several people, and that's what it is. Okay? Jackson administration claims student to faculty ratio improved from 18 to 1 to 13 to 1. I'm going to ask the provost to speak. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Is this on? Okay. So, um, the student faculty ratio back in 1998 2000 was indeed 18 to 1. If, if you look at the overall numbers, undergraduates plus graduate students, that number today stands as 15 to 1. Why we report 13 to 1 is very simple. The US News and World Report, which asked for these rankings, has made it very clear that report the number of undergraduate students to faculty who teach those undergraduates. That is why it is reported as 13 to 1 today. I think, Dr. Jackson, the second question is related to this, so I may as well speak to the issue of the faculty as well. That uh, faculty counts, that the numbers have uh, not changed much. Well, um, one has to look at it this way. First of all, the number is three, instead of 360, we have hired 377 new faculty members since uh, 2000. Now beyond that, faculty hiring is about renewal of faculty. It is about bringing in new ideas, faculty who start new areas of research, new programs. So it is more than just numbers. It is about changing the quality of education that exists on our campus. If you look at the absolute numbers of faculty, uh, if you look at the total counts, it was 409 faculty in 2000, and it's 489 today. So yes, the numbers have grown. The numbers of uh, tenure, tenure track faculty are slightly up, but they are not up because we do have retirements. This is, this is like any other university. We have turnovers. National averages on faculty turnovers are between six and 7%. We sit between four and 5%, 4.3% to be exact, is averaged over the last few years. We will continue to hire faculty because that's what we have laid out in the legislative plan. And our objective is to build this to 5,000. That is what the capital campaign is all about as well. And I think if you look very carefully, 
What I speak about is hiring faculty. I've never said that the number of net new faculty was 360. And so it is, as the provost has said, about renewing the faculty. But the faculty crosses uh, a spectrum with tenured and tenure track faculty, lecturers, <laughs> professors of practice, and teaching fellows. And so we have a, a, a robust cohort of faculty. Our intent <coughs> is to grow the tenured and tenure track faculty, but that also depends upon uh, the success of the capital campaign, and so I would urge all of you to help us be successful in that campaign, uh, because that is the way to really do that. Then it's RPI claims 400 million raised thus far in the capital campaign. Greg, do you want to say anything? I absolutely want to talk about that. An institution is either in two states in a campaign or preparing for a campaign. And so, yes, we actually are in a campaign and we actually have raised over $400 million. And we're moving towards the 400, over $425 million. And so we are in a campaign and uh, we started, counted the campaign at the end of the last campaign. And that's what every institution does. And uh, that's what happens. And if you, that's standard across all institutions. And, and if you really want to uh, look at it the right way, there's a difference between uh, accounting, and some people want to look at that to challenge the numbers, and what counts as a campaign commitment. And a, and a campaign is about the commitments that people make to support the institution. It could be in the form of requests, it could be pledges paid out over time, it could be outright uh, cash gifts, uh, et cetera. And, and there is no uh, hiding of that, and there are rules uh, that are case rules, which is the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education, that we follow uh, very carefully. But then the actual uh, accounting that goes through the financial statements has to do with cash and when the cash comes in. And so those are two uh, very different ways. And so that the way that we discuss uh, what we've raised in the campaign is, is consistent with that of every other uh, university in the United States. I'm a trustee of MIT, and they don't do it any differently than we do. Then there's the statement that the administration withholds 10% from donations to student organizations. Greg, you want to talk about that? So every institution does have a surcharge, and every gift is, receives a surcharge at the institution. And um, that means different, and this is standard across the board. Every institution sets a, a, a surcharge fee, and it's not just on, it's one thing, it's on everything, it's only once. And then finally, Dr. Jackson claimed nothing has changed with regard to the Rensselaer Union. I'll let Travis speak to that. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. So there's a few things. So the Senate lost its ability to approve changes with the student handbook. The handbook for student rights and responsibilities is a university document. We have a responsibility to make sure that uh, not only is it up to date and, and uh, following all of the external state federal uh, legislation that would tell us how we have to uh, enact policy, we also want to make sure that it's, uh, it's appropriate for our students, our student community, and the, the larger Rensselaer community. Uh, students are a part of the process of deciding what will be a part of, of any changes as we go forward. We've been meeting with uh, folks from the Student Senate and, as well as uh, other students on campus. Uh, we're not going to have a process, however, that uh, puts in place um, you know, a bureaucracy that will delay any kind of change that's necessary for us to comply with state or federal policies or laws. We're also going to make sure that um, the student voices are heard. Uh, we may not always agree on what those policies will be, but we will make sure that uh, we are working with students on what is best for our community. Um, the executive board lost its power over the activity fee. The activity fee um, is voted on by the executive board. They work with the finance division of the institution to identify what an appropriate top limit would be every year. So that's taken into consideration uh, as, as you know, it compares with things like the increase of tuition, increase in room and board, and all of those other costs that students have to incur to be students here. And so uh, you know, they still have that ability to, to set that fee. 
the executive board as well as um, uh, the student uh, uh, groups will every year go through a budgeting process to determine what organizations are assigned which uh, which dollar amounts. You know that's that's uh, absolutely still something that the, the union is doing that hasn't changed whatsoever. Uh, other than they work pretty closely with our finance division to be sure it's an appropriate fee. I'll come back to you. I see that. Remind me if I don't. So I'm sure you're right. Um, the Archer Center was a roof of the union placed under student success. So the Archer Center did certainly have its uh, its beginnings in the union. It still is connected with the union in many ways. Um, as it grew from just a couple of staff who were really focused on leadership development with student organizations, it started to move into classrooms, working with the engineering department and others. Uh, that staff grew. The dollars came from university and, and uh, schools. Uh, and we're at a place where we really want the Archer Center and their leadership development to be something that every student experiences as they come in. That through orientation and throughout their experience here as a student. So it still very much has a connection with the union, but it, it does reside like some other offices uh, in other parts of student life. You know, the union as a, as a whole resides in student life and, um, and uh, is a part of my portfolio. So, um, so technically, it's, it is, yes, a part of student success, but still very much a part of the union in many ways. Hiring administrative personnel is largely controlled by the administration. If by that you mean that it follows the uh, fairly standard institute process for hiring people to make sure that it's a fair, uh, equitable process, uh, a legal process, yes. Uh, however, uh, we just hired, went through a process of hiring uh, several people in the union over the past year. And that was uh, mostly driven through the union itself, the administrative staff there uh, working with students and, and through the executive board to make sure that all of those appointments were, um, were, were you know, going, going through the executive board, vote for uh, approval of recommendation. Um, that process worked very well. We're really happy to have uh, those new staff on our, in our, uh, in our, in our uh, union as well as a part of our division. Uh, the class councils are no longer able to email their class list. Uh, they don't have direct uh, access. You know, we, we've looked at uh, what are the best ways for us to be able to communicate. We have a project that's ongoing to identify the most effective ways that we can in, uh, share information with the community, especially our students. And here's what you tell us. Email first is not the most effective way, uh, but that, um, that streamlining it so that uh, students aren't bombarded with just hundreds of emails, I know. If you're getting even half as much as I get every day, it's hard to keep up with your inbox. And so uh, we are working closely with, uh, with the class deans and, and the folks in the union. Uh, Maria Roberts works closely with each of the class councils to plan ahead what needs to be put out to classes uh, in a timely fashion to inform them about what's going on with each class. Uh, if there's a need for uh, kind of an emergent sort of, of email to go out, we can accommodate that. But we're also driving uh, student organizations in general, as well as ourselves and our offices, to use other, other formats. You know, how do we use social media in a more effective way? How do we use those other sorts of opportunities to inform our community about what's going on and what they need to know? Because we know email is not the most effective way to do that. I'll address the last two bullets. But you might want to get the gentleman's question there. Yes, thank you. I don't know if they had approval right. I know that um, they've always been, you know, we've, we've always, uh, well, I shouldn't say always. There, there was definitely a time that we would go and, and present those changes to the student, uh, student senate. That, that hasn't changed. We're still working with the student senate on what those changes would look like. I think that this recent, um, process of updating the handbook actually, uh, I, I felt like it went pretty well. I think that we worked pretty well together uh, and we'll continue to, to do that, working with the Student Life Committee in particular, but with the Student Senate and as a whole. And so then the last two points are that the students no longer have representatives on certain trustee committees. Uh, this was a trustee decision. The trustees are the legal stewards of the university and the administration uh, has the legal responsibility and authority relative to how the university runs. And the students are invited to meetings that uh, relate to them as students, primarily uh, the Student Life Committee, but the Finance, the Advancement, the Audit Committee are all statutory uh, 
com uh, committees of the board. And no, students are not representatives on those committees. But there are any number of administrators who also don't come to all of those meetings. And so, uh, and then it says the student body no longer meets with Dr. Jackson with the same frequency as they once did. I think it's very important, whatever your feelings are, and however much you may be worked up about something, that to tell the truth and the whole truth. And uh, one can look at a question of whether I have met in the recent years as frequently with the Grand Marshal and the PU as I may have in the past. And the answer is no, because the, uh, first of all, I have a schedule that's pretty uh, hectic, but in addition, I'm one who believes we have to have fruitful meetings and we have to have agendas and things that we want to move ahead. But I meet with students in any number of forms. Uh, uh, Lee McElroy has me meet with the uh, athletes. I have a, a clan bake for all the uh, heads of the uh, student clubs and so forth. I meet with students informally, that is how I found out about the concerns of some young women about safe travel uh, away from the campus. And I immediately had Claude uh, look at expanding the routes and the, the times of service of the shuttles. And then Greg, I'd Greg go out and he got us these two cars donated from American Honda to create the Safe Ride program. And so I try to do things for the students. And would I like to spend more time uh, meeting with students, absolutely. But if you want to ask, you know, where my focus is, if I can create an off-campus commons, if I can create a safe ride service, if I can increase the financial aid budget, if we can still keep hiring instructional staff, if we can improve uh, student housing, you know, we've done a multi-year renovation of the quad, and so forth, then those are the things that are my greatest responsibility. And <coughs> And I have people who are the leaders that I always introduce at uh, meetings like this because they have specific responsibilities in specific areas. And so it is simply an untruth to try to propagate that I do not uh, meet with the students. And I don't want to use a, a stronger word, but it is important that all of us tell the whole truth. And But I really care deeply about our students. I care deeply about the full Rensselaer community. The board, and I've said this in more than one forum, asked me to come here to effect transformative change. I've come to do that, and that is what has been happening. There are many things that had to be addressed when I got here. Not all of those decisions are popular, but in the end, you know, one makes the decisions that one has to make, and I committed and I've stayed here for 19 years in spite of things that have shown up in the media, both internal to the university and external, some of which has been pretty egregious. But I'm all committed to what I do. And I love the people here. And that's my statement. Thank you very much. Some of the other people here have some uh, question about geopolitics of 2030. <laughs> or our because we're not going to keep rehashing these same questions. That's why we went through them uh, in an organized fashion. Please. Dr. Jackson, what are the concerns about artificial intelligence and robotics? And sorry, what are the concerns that a lot of people have about artificial intelligence, robotics, and related areas, which are wonderful in many ways, but they do have a downside potential that's pretty frightening. Um, are we doing anything at Rensselaer either here or in our relationships with others across the country and globally to address those kinds of ethical concerns? The answer is yes, but I'm going to start with our provost because I've actually uh, put him in charge of our major artificial intelligence machine learning initiative, and then I would ask our Dean of Science to make uh, comments, and our Dean of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences to make any comments they wish. So the response to your question, um, are we doing things here on our campus in artificial intelligence and machine learning? Yes. 
There are pockets of faculty in the School of Engineering, Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, and Science that are working on critical issues. Uh, you brought up a very interesting uh, twist on the dangerous aspect, the dangers that lurk behind artificial intelligence. And yes, we have uh, some things that are looking at actually the ethics of artificial intelligence. So that's in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. But to bring all of these disparate groups together, <coughs> Uh, with assistance from IBM, we are organizing a major effort on our campus in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning. We have just launched a series of research projects, uh, which is within our faculty. We have a plan to actually identify areas where we think we need more strength, and we are going to be aggressively recruiting new faculty to those areas to build up strength, because I believe that uh, cyber-enabled systems is really the fourth industrial revolution and AI and machine learning is going to be a big player in all of this. Uh, Kurt? Thanks. As with any powerful tool, uh, one has to be cognizant of what one does with it. And so this is an area that we take very seriously because we do believe that, for example, with our data dexterity initiative for all the undergraduates that was just announced, we are basically spanning now into new space where we're now, how do we apply that data in ways, for example, that have ethical boundaries, uh, in ways that we generate models. When you generate a machine learning model, did you build in a bias, for example? If you're going to use that to make decisions that change people's lives or potentially affect them, you have to be very concerned about this. And in fact, when, uh, when we had the Supreme Court justice here uh, not that long ago, we were talking about this computational ethics with him. Uh, the Chief Justice. Anyway, I'm going to let Mary talk about the ethics component a little more. Um, I really appreciate your question. I have to tell you, I think about it every day. Um, and so in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, we struggle with this on a daily basis. Um, through our courses called Haas Inquiry, we encourage students to wrestle with these difficult questions from a multidisciplinary perspective and understanding that context changes over time. So what is the context today may change, you know, four years from now. Just example is the Mark Zuckerberg interview with the New York Times saying if anybody would have told me when I was at Harvard that I would be engaged in this conversation, I wouldn't have believed it. And and so the the idea that's been brought up about resiliency, the idea about being, paying attention to what's going on, the things about being critical thinkers are foremost in the mind of the faculty in humanities, arts, and social sciences. So um, I know many of you have taken a Haas Inquiry course. If you didn't have that experience, let me know. <laughs> and uh, one of the questions we like to ask um, of people like Dean Brenneman is just because you can, should you? That's uh, an important question because as you know, actually any technology sits on a knife edge. And when I talked about the geopolitics of 2030, I talked about drones. And people think about drones delivering packages. Well, a bomb is a package. Uh, one thinks about 3D printing. Well, if one can 3D print grenade launchers, one has weaponized the technology. CRISPR gene editing. One can uh, create the pathogenicity of uh, some a biological agent, uh, and so forth. And so it is important, and I, and I thank you for bringing up that question, that we don't lose sight of. And that's why, you know, what Mary and, and uh, her folks do, and the the uh, Haas inquiry courses are meant to touch all of the students, because we want them and need them to think about just the kind of thing that you raised. So thank you for doing that. Say another question. Yes, please. Um, can you comment on the two open Office of Civil Rights investigations currently against RPI, one being a Title IX complaint and the other being a Title VI complaint? Curtis and Craig. Yeah, we, we have uh, one complaint that I'm aware of, and that complaint, in fact, we have. Uh, OCR uh, interviewing a few people today regarding that one open complaint. And it's about basically individual putting information in on the network 
that was inappropriate. So we took action against the individual that uh, perpetrated, perpetrated that uh, act. However, the respondent or the complainant was not satisfied with that. So I feel good that the university did what it needed to do in this, in this regard. And so we take these cases very seriously. I think since February of 2015, we've had 125 sexual assault and misconduct cases on this campus. And we resolve those within a 60-day period, or try to do that, providing we can get the responses from the witnesses that we've identified. And in fact, uh, currently, uh, we resolved all of them except I think we have about 30 open cases in which we will uh, get those resolved, uh, try to get those resolved before the end of the semester. So I'm not concerned about uh, that open case. I think uh, we were very prudent uh, what we did, and I'm pleased that we took the correct action. I, I suspect the other case you might be talking about is actually not a Title IX case. It may be a, it's an academic case. Yeah. Right. So, but, and so, look, I mean, the only thing, point I would make is, um, and look, we want to eradicate all of these things, but they happen on campuses throughout the country, and we deal with them, we address them, we address them fairly and thoroughly, and sometimes people aren't satisfied and they go to the government, and so that happens and we deal with it there. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, so if I may, I talked with a friend actually about the numbers of the faculty. So this is actually a question more geared towards the provost and human resources regarding the faculty number. So I'll just give a bit of a background to this. Um, I was doing some research on the information and the numbers I found from the U.S. Department of Education that they had available online is that in 2001, RPI had I believe it was 331 tenure and tenure track faculty. And by 2016, they only had 329. So over those 15 years, it was a net decrease of two. I think the so, provost, I don't mean to cut you off, but, but I think the provost has made the point. And, and, and let's be clear. And again, this is about the truth and the whole truth. What you've ever heard me say is hiring a certain number of faculty. People come to the university, People who are here retire, some people pass away, people leave, people go through the tenure process, they may or may not get tenure. So the net result may be that on the tenured and tenure track ranks, the number has remained about constant, with some fluctuations up and down. We're not backing away uh, from that. But what we also have done is we recognize, particularly in certain disciplines, that lecturers and professors of practice bring uh, unique skills uh, to the classroom. And in fact, what we've done over the years is standardize and professionalize uh, their contracts to ensure that they have uh, employment and income protections as well as the same benefits that everyone else has. And so you heard the provost say, that if you look at the total net FTE faculty, we were 409, we're 489. So there really is not a, 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 any gain to be made talking about a two-person change uh, in the tenured and tenure track rights. We've always said that uh, having more endowment to actually hire more faculty tenure on the tenure track is critical. And that's the focus that we have. But in the meantime, we ensure that our instructional staff is robust. And so, you know, that's all that really can be said. And so I would just ask you to look at the complete picture and not uh, trying to poke holes at, at what we've said. And I think if you look at my remarks, I talk about hiring. I've never talked about that the net faculty was 360 or, or whatever the number may have been. We track the number we hire because hiring is also refreshing as people leave, as other things happen. And that's what we try to stay focused on. But thank you for the question. Uh, is there another one? Um, I still have part of my question. What's the other part? So 
I, and this is a clarification if you may, based on what you said. The faculty 500 plan. Yes. Is that having 500 faculty? By no, we've said we want to have, to have 500 tenured and tenure track faculty, but it depends upon the success of the capital campaign. We've said that. And, and that's all we can say. Okay, so the point of my question was I was going to ask, since it is hinged upon the capital campaign, how do you balance the current amount of tenure and tenure track faculty with increasing class sizes every year? I think I said that we have instructional staff and faculty in various categories. We have tenured and tenure track faculty. We have lecturers who do an excellent job teaching our students. We have professors of practice who have not come through the tenure track, but they've had unique professional experiences and career experiences that they bring to the classroom, and in fact, to our research. And so any university that you look at uh, has a balance uh, of faculty like that. And so in point of fact, though Rensselaer, on a net faculty basis, has a, a smaller percentage of non-tenure track faculty than most universities around the country. Please. Anyone else? Up here, excuse me. Yes, please. Considering what we've heard today from students and other people, like even having this pamphlet in our hands, right. there seems to be an element of distrust between the administration and the students. Um, do you have any opinions on where that may originate from and if there's possibly some actions that could be taken to alleviate stress that students may have with the, with the administration? Well, well, maybe you could tell us because I think we spend a, a lot of time uh, with students, talking to students, trying to understand their needs. But we also size the number of actual students who uh, appear to be upset. And I would say that the vast majority uh, of our students just go about their business every day. And when I talk to, and I'm out a lot because we are out fundraising, talking to parents of current students, I've yet to run across one who tells me that his or her daughter or son is not having a wonderful time at Rensselaer. And that, in the end, is the metric for the experience. But a true metric is what happens for the students when they graduate. And on those measures, in terms of the jobs they, they get, the salaries they command, the, the companies they start, the leadership they provide, the service to our country, the outcomes are stellar. And you know, all of us would like to be able to spend more time talking with students and doing things, and we do a lot. And I think you should really compare what happens at most universities in terms of the time that senior administrators, including presidents, spend with students. And I think we stack up quite well. And so the important thing I would like you to keep in mind is that our goal is to try to improve the student experience and the outcomes and the support we're able to provide. You know, every day we try to make a difference. We've expanded, the, we knew there was a problem with counseling needs. And so we've created a, a triage center and a triage process and brought in a triage counselor to speed up the uh, help and support and the assessment students can get in that arena. So those are the things that I think are the important things. And I think uh, you have to tell me, because a lot of the what we hear and that you all read off your sheets in, are incoming from the outside. And so maybe you have some uh, visibility or some intelligence you can share with us about that. Please. Uh, this question is for Mr. Easton. Uh, is it true that when forwarding the Bystrop email, you said that it is important to get the truth out there? And if so, coming from the Vice President of Institute Advancement, how does that not appear to be official institute uh, policies and or stance? And uh, based on that, how does it seem uh, appropriate to send such an email with such a message? You or Richie want to address that? I, I answered the question and I did send the email and yes, that may have been, uh, that is 
actually the statement. Use the uh, mic. That is, actually, that is actually the statement, and knowing the factors that I know, if they were the same today, I would do the same thing. So, and we, that is where it is. So, if you do the same thing today, does that mean that it is? Official Institute? Uh, it is not. We have never it argued not. that ask me that question. Yeah. No, it is not an official uh, university position. Uh, Mr. Easton decided to share it with the alumni group because there were many other things, I think, that were being shared. And, and he decided that he wanted to give the alums a heads up. And that was his decision. But it represents no official position. I mean, there are a lot of things that are floating around here, including in this room, that are assertions. That And the reason we've chosen to uh, walk through them is because we don't want a misrepresentation in terms of uh, what the university's position is and what we're doing in each of these arenas. But, but thank you. I'm not going to go any further. Please come down and talk with folks afterwards, because I'm not going to do the this uh, back and forth. It's not fair to the full audience. Anyone else? Yes, please. So uh, I'm the uh, lecturer of engineering. I'm a uh, uh, 2009. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm a lecturer in engineering, and I'm a 2009 uh, McNair scholar uh, in the RDI. As a matter of fact, I was asked to come speak uh, at my university's uh, McNair commencement, uh, uh, because you know I, I managed to make the program. Uh, the McNair program was really instrumental in me getting to RPI and getting through the program. Uh, and I guess my, my general question is, um, especially given uh, uh, your glowing words uh, about Ronald McNair, uh, why doesn't RPI have a McNair program, or is there like a story for uh, where we might find you achieve a McNair program someday? Well, I think the important point is having support mechanisms um, for our students, including for underrepresented minority students. And so uh, we've created two scholarships. Uh, one, the uh, Eddie Knowles Scholarship, one that in fact I, I created. And the other is the Garnet Baltimore Scholarship to honor uh, Garnet Baltimore, our uh, first African American graduate. And so for us, um, you know, those are the pathways that we feel uh, would appeal to alums and allow us to raise the money that we want to raise to support students. And we have a number of other named scholarships, you know, across the board to support students more broadly. And, and, uh, and so we've done that uh, relative to people who have been part of the Rensselaer community. And let me just say that Ronald McNair was a friend of mine, actually. And so a very, very good friend of mine. And so I naturally was quite upset when he died in the Space Shuttle Challenger accident. But I think the way we've structured things to raise the funds for the purposes I've described are the right ways for us at this time. Although I think the McNair scholarships are fabulous. So thank you. Yes, please. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Stan, please. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the question. I, uh, uh, the president spoke to the uh, support at the undergraduate level, but uh, at the graduate level as part of the graduate tuition and student support policy, which uh, I guess was uh, uh, put in place 2002, 2003. Uh, we, it's, it's very clear in there, it's very explicit that we do support McNair scholars uh, who do come to campus. So when they identify themselves, uh, that uh, I, you know, I do make a point of providing them support uh, while they're here. So I think it's, it's fair to say at both the undergraduate and the, the graduate level, we, we have a program for McNair scholars. But well, what it says is maybe we need to give more visibility for that. But thank you for raising it. The gentleman in the red shirt. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, so one of the aspects of the capital campaign, campaign uh, is to expand ECAP and build a new uh, science building. My question is, is there any plan to update our existing facilities? Absolutely. And you heard me talk about uh, uh, expanding the Johnson Engineering Center. <laughs> 
and we're looking at uh, creating an addition to that and trying to do that as much as possible. But in, embedded in the campaign are a lot of different uh, campaign uh, and physical structure improvements, renovations, uh, repurposing and upgrades and expansions. So all of that is there. I just, you know, I'm not prepared to, to give you the comprehensive list, but uh, I did mention the fact that we've had a multi-year uh, renovation of the quad going on. We're gonna be air conditioning other res halls, including the summer, and as we do those, we, we make improvements. And so there are a number of projects like that. We have a, a multi-year undergraduate classroom upgrade program, undergraduate laboratory, and so uh, these things will continue to go on. And a number of them go on irrespective of the campaign, but with the campaign, we expect to be able to accelerate. So thank you. Yes, please. Um, well, uh, did I have a um, we have plans to go V1 and other sorts of other hockey. <laughs> <laughs> now, I got to ask you, you're a football player? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the question has come up from time to time, but, but, but let me let Lee begin an answer for you. Yeah, we have a, we have a unique model, and that's a great question. Uh, with, as you know, our Division I men and women's ice hockey in our 21 Division three teams, and we call it multi-classification. And that's where we are, and we're working to provide 600 stu student athletes with the best experiences. I think they will tell you uh, whether they're D1 or D3, uh, field hockey, swimming, whatever the sport, uh, they're having a great experience and uh, they're really, really enjoying what's going on in the department. But at this point, we have no plans to expand that program beyond its current composition. Right, and we get asked that and approached from time to time. But I would point out that uh, with ECAV, uh, our facilities, you know, are really D1 class and probably at the upper end. But we do subscribe to the scholar athlete model. Uh, Ice hockey has been our traditional D1 sport, and when I came, it was only men's ice hockey as D1. So actually, I elevated the women's ice hockey to D1 because I felt we needed to have that parity. But at this time, no, we're not contemplating um, uh, going to another division level in the other sports. But our students compete very well, and they have a great experience. Yes, please. Uh, I think the answer is yes. I think under the class model, we're looking at that. Um, I don't know, uh, Stan, if you or um, Prabhat want to make any comments in that regard. So I think international students uh, represent a very uh, important component of our campus community. Uh, I can speak for myself. I came to the United States as an international student myself. And I think uh, they bring a great deal of uh, culture breadth with them. It, it adds to the atmosphere here. Uh, Stan, through his, uh, through his office, runs uh, through graduate education programs to uh, bring in international students and to provide them with the right atmosphere. I think as part of the uh, class, uh, there is a strong focus on integrating international students because we have 10 to 12 percent of our students entering class are international students. We would like them to be international and integrated at the same time. 46% of our graduate students are international, international about 13% of the undergrads. I just, I wanted to add to that, under the student life, under the new portfolio of student transitions, which is my portfolio, we're in the process of hiring a new director for international student services, and our goal is to move from a very transactional model to a more community-based model. So we're definitely looking to make some changes. And we had a lot of students involved in that search, so we're looking forward to growing. So thanks. Thank you. Stan, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, anything else? Well, Wex is not here. Dr. <coughs> Jackson? Yes. Uh, one more here. Uh, regarding the expansion of the facilities on campus, yes. what are your plans to improve the off-campus commons and it's not a great space for big group meetings. 
That's true. It's not a large space. Do you want to say anything about it? Thank you.